Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. This is the warning to start taking seats. Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Liebman. I'm a professor here at the Kennedy School, and I am so pleased to welcome, all, uh, welcome you all here today. Um, we're especially pleased to welcome Governor Charlie Baker and Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito, uh, whose work uh, in the Commonwealth is, is the reason uh, that we are here today. And we're also very pleased to welcome everyone who's watching this over, over the live stream. Our mission at the Rappaport Institute here uh, at Harvard is to connect our students uh, and our scholars uh, with local government officials uh, and our cities and towns and our state government uh, in, in the Commonwealth. Uh, and we are so um, uh, grateful uh, to the Rappaport family for their vision and their support uh, that has made this all possible and to Jim Rappaport who is here uh, with us today. As part of this mission, we spent a lot of time talking to local officials, and over the past few years, we started to hear something. Uh, we started to hear them telling us that they were working more closely with the state uh, than they ever had before. They started telling us that they were able to access uh, resources to meet their local needs uh, in, in, in new ways, and we eventually started realizing that what we were hearing wasn't random. Uh, it was the result of a very deliberate strategy by the baker Polito administration. And we decided it was worth doing a, a real research project around this so that we could better understand uh, what it was that was working uh, and that we could, so that we could document the innovations uh, and tell the story so that future administrations uh, and, and administrations around the country could learn from uh, uh, the innovations here in Massachusetts. Um, so I'm incredibly excited to be here today uh, celebrating the release of our policy brief uh, with the leaders who made it, po uh, uh, made, made it possible. Uh, and a minute, in a minute, I'll hand the stage to, to Governor Baker, uh, who can talk more about the lieutenant governor and the contributions uh, she made in elevating and championing the needs of our local communities in Massachusetts. Um, but first, I need to uh, introduce Danielle Cerny, uh, who researched and authored the policy brief uh, that we're here to talk about today. Danielle is a visiting fellow at the Rappaport Institute, uh, and she lent her... Uh, 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 extensive experience in state and local government uh, to producing uh, this report. Most recently, Danielle served as Deputy Chief of Staff uh, to uh, then-Governor uh, Raimondo in Rhode Island, uh, and then after that, she was the Chief Performance Officer for the state of R Rhode Island. 
Um, before that, uh, I was very lucky to have her as a colleague uh, at my Harvard Kennedy School Government Performance Lab, where she led our work in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Chicago. Uh, and Danielle has deep uh, roots in Massachusetts government, having worked uh, first uh, as an aide to a Massachusetts state senator, uh, and then uh, for a couple years as the social innovation finance manager uh, at the Executive Office of Administration and Finance. Uh, and even before that, back when she was a Kennedy School student, she was a Rappaport Summer Fellow at a uh, and that's really where she got her start. Uh, so needless to say, she was the perfect person to, to do this study and, and, and write this policy brief. Um, so uh, before we hand it over to the, the Lieutenant Governor and, and, and Danielle to talk about uh, uh, what we're talking about to, uh, today, it's my deep pleasure to uh, welcome the Governor here to, to say a few words. Thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> so I'm going to be really brief. I do want to say how thrilled I am to look out and see so many of our partners in municipal government with us today. Um, and I hope some others are on the, are on the live stream. Um, Lieutenant Governor and I are fond of saying that there are 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts, and we love them all equally. Um, and I, Jim, I want to say to you and your family that um, the Rappaport Center the work is important, but so are the people. There's an enormous number of folks who did huge work for us over the course of our time in state government that made a major difference in the quality of the work we did and, and what we were able to deliver for people. So thank you. And, uh, and I want to thank the folks here at the Kennedy School for hosting this as well. And I'm, I'm going to be super brief. I'm basically going to say that the Lieutenant Governor and I both served on our local select boards. Jay Ash, who was our first Economic Affairs Secretary, had been the city manager in Chelsea for a very long time. Um, there were a lot of municipal folks all over our administration early on, and that wasn't an accident. Um, we're big believers that um, state government, if it's working well, is enabling cities and towns to succeed and to grow and to be successful. And, um, and the work that was done by the Lieutenant Governor and by Lily Zarella and some others that's in this policy brief is in many respects a terrific sort of view in uh, to what it looks like when you take a concept and then brick by brick turn it into something special. And that's exactly what happened. And uh, it wouldn't have happened without the help of a lot of people, but it especially wouldn't have happened without a lieutenant governor who really wanted to make this something unique, different, and sustainable. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. I think we're afternoon now, but I, no, you know, you've, got, you've got to forgive Danielle because while she was working on this really special project, uh, she's the mother of a toddler and a newborn. Oh, however, you. however, uh, um, baby is now sleeping from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. How does that happen? <laughs> um, and is she it, it, four months old? So that's like wow. miraculous, right? A lot of parent envy out there. <laughs> so let me just start by saying a huge thank you to the Rappaport Institute. I get to talk to Phyllis, and I get to see you today, Jim. We appreciate this opportunity uh, on, on so many levels, and for your partnership with our administration over these past eight years has been uh, exceptional, as the governor noted. I want to thank Jeff Liedman for your leadership. There you are. Uh, and being so enthusiastic and encouraging about uh, this project and, and getting it off, uh, t off the ground. Uh, obviously, you're going to hear uh, from Danielle, but she is, is absolutely the perfect person to take this on, having had experience in state government, in it, 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 our state government and Rhode Island state government, and then to be able to listen to the various voices, some of whom are in this room, and take the information in and put it into this report uh, is exceptional work. And we are very uh, hopeful that not only will it serve as a, a tool for people here in Massachusetts, but for other states and counties and places uh, that need to think about governance and get stuff done. Uh, let me also just say thank you to Steve Kadish 
Uh, he was our first uh, chief of staff, and I want to thank you for uh, introducing me to Danielle and to Jeff and to this team. I so very much appreciate uh, you. I uh, also want to thank Catherine Carlson. Where are you, Catherine? Uh, the logistics of all this uh, and being so supportive to our, our project. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a shout out and ask for some of the municipalities that are represented today to stand. First, Jeff Beckwith, where are you? Thank you very much, um, MMA Association. And if you're a, a municipal elected or serve in a managerial role, please stand. There you go. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being such incredible friends to our administration and for those who are watching at home. I know I got a few texts this afternoon because in your position, stuff always happens. So I forgive you uh, for today. Uh, I also want to just give a shout out to uh, Sean Cronin, who's obviously here on the front row, uh, comes from municipal background, Brookline. There's a whole lot of talent uh, coming out of Brookline. But Governor Baker uh, knew of your talent and wanted you to come into our organization early on and uh, elevate the, the, the vision of local services. And you have done that and so much more. If you could just please stand so people can put a name and a face together. <laughs> then a lot of governor's uh, of office people are here. I do want to give a particular shout out to Team LG. Can you, <laughs> Lily and Anisha, uh, who are here, and can others please stand from the Lieutenant Governor's office? <laughs> and the shy ones in the back are, are the ones that were on our team before, but did a whole lot of traveling as part of this project. Caitlin and Shelby, and I know Dan Gates is around here too. So uh, thank you all, and thank you to the Governor's office for uh, all of the, the partnership uh, obviously, over these past eight years, it's been incredible. But the most important partner is Governor Baker. And I just want to thank my friend, my colleague in government, for making the decision to, which was really important for our administration, about a partnership in the governor and lieutenant governor's office being one. And that partnership formed a long time ago, but more so on the campaign trail and then, of course, coming in and leading together. Uh, I will always be grateful for that decision and having my office literally within you know, shouting distance of yours over these past eight years. And to then be uh, so intentional around our communities, which we're going to talk about uh, now, and being uh, so uh, invested in the cities and towns of this Commonwealth loving it as I do and many of you do to see it literally transform in places over these past eight years. So it's been an honor of a lifetime to work with this great governor and friend. It's such a good kickoff to, because we have so many of the people in this room who really lived and breathed this work. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, and so I'm sure that some of this will, will feel really close to home for the people who are here and watching. So we previewed a little bit at the beginning. We set out a few months ago to try to understand what was happening <laughs> on the ground. What was so different about the way that this administration was working with cities and towns that we kept hearing about it? And what were the pieces? Did it really work? Could we bottle it? particularly as we, we start to prepare for transitions here and elsewhere, how could we try to capture this? And I know the policy brief is in the room, hot off the press, so just do a little bit of framing before we, we jump into our conversation. What we found was something really different, a really innovative approach to creating collaborative working relationships with cities and towns that had led to very tangible improvements on the ground. And so the policy brief gets into some of the pieces, not all of them. As the governor said, there was so much work that went into this. But we tried to unpack what were some of those core pieces that made this work. So we're going to get into all of that. But, Lieutenant Governor, I want to start the why. 
<laughs> why it was that this, this was something that was so important to you and to the governor. You've got local experience. You traveled around the state as a candidate. How did this come to become, become a priority? Well, while it's not a prerequisite to become <laughs> governor, lieutenant governor, to be a local official, it certainly was informative uh, to this governor and lieutenant governor. Having started our public service as elected officials, in our respective hometowns, obviously, you know, Swampscott and Shrewsbury a little bit more so because of who we are. But the work that we were able to be a part of as selectmen in our towns was really, to both of us, uh, in informative, uh, inspiring, and very meaningful. And being someone who is part of a family who valued local government and serving on boards, finance committees, planning boards, conservation commissions, town meeting members, we both felt that it's the least appreciated but should be most valued. And when you think about when you go out to vote, the least participated in in terms of voting in a municipal election, yet is the most essential part of government because it is the delivery, directly delivering the service that touches people's lives. And we feel strongly that people judge how things are going, not so much by the, the headlines on the evening news or their, their Twitter account. It's really how they feel when they wake up every day where they are. You know, can they rely on that bus to get their kids to school? Are there roads and sidewalks in shape that is presentable? Are there pot, you know, potholes and other problems? Can they uh, rely on their emergency services to be there? Is their community safe? Is there a vibrant downtown? Are there things for me to be able to do? Can I afford to live in this community as I grow older? Are there services for aging people? Like all the things that you think about where you live are the role of local government. And so for us, we knew coming into office while there had to be certain decisions at a high level made to prioritize communities, it was going to be incredibly important as we laid out our overall strategy of a simple one. Building strong communities means we're gonna build a stronger commonwealth. And if you take that one line and start to frame up a system that can truly improve the quality of municipal services, you can accomplish that goal. Well, and it's simple in concept, right? <laughs> We've learned. It, is, it is a really purposeful strategy that you ended up building here. And one of the first things in entering office was the executive office within weeks of, of entering that really stated publicly the executive commitment to this strategy. And then really importantly, it started to put into place the components and the people that would be necessary to do that. And you were a big piece of that. But I think it, that there was some skepticism. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're on the campaign trail and visiting places that you should be visiting. You know, And I think in some respects, and when you're running for office, you think of it politically, you go to where you think the population of people are that will vote for you and spend your time there. However, we felt that this had to be a different approach, that every community matters. You put the politics behind and you start to serve all of the communities. However, there was a couple of things that stuck with us when we were campaigning that helped us form our strategy at the get-go. And that was when we would hear things like in Western Mass, uh, nice to see you, uh, Charlie, nice to see you, Karen, but you know, we won't see you again once you're elected to office. And that really, you know, hit us hard, and especially someone not from Boston, from the central part of the state, and I'd say that, well, I'm, you know, I'm from central part of the state, and they think central part is Western Mass, but, <laughs> but it wasn't enough. And there really was a skepticism whether this administration would follow through on its commitment that, yes, your community matters, and what we would do. So two weeks in, governor's very first executive order was forming the community compact and the cabinet of people that would be uh, devoted to building strong communities and tasked the lieutenant governor uh, to be that champion, to be that liaison, to be that 
direct connection from our office to every city town of the Commonwealth. Sounds good. And then what? Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's exactly right. I want to kind of follow the, the skepticism thread. You've been named executive champion. These play, pieces have been put in place. But you know, you've heard from being out there that you know, some people still don't believe it's going to change for them. So paint us a picture. What do you do to start showing that you're really going to create a meaningful seat at the table? Well, there were a few things that happened early on in our administration. Uh, certainly the executive order was the in in intentional act. Uh, we also knew that, in, the governor talked about this in the opening, we needed to create an advisory group, uh, not just us talking to ourselves, but of the municipal leaders, mayors, and managers to form a, a group, and many of you are, are in this room, uh, and Jay Ash and Carolyn Kirk, uh, you were also part of that early advisory group, official, and so that then we were in real time being able to say these are the things we're thinking about, does this make sense, how would you format this so that it will work? That was important. Uh, we also did a survey uh, in March, it was March 23rd, and Carolyn and I were up on the fourth floor saying, okay, we're gonna do a monkey survey? Okay, let's just do it, right? Don't get too worked up on the details and how professional this is gonna look, but just let's get the question out here. How can state government change its regulations, its laws, its procedures to better serve local government? So we threw that out there and we sat back and the, the movie goes, like 1,300 responses from you uh, across, from people across the Commonwealth. So we knew we had something to work with and we had to use the advisory group and uh, the expertise of the municipal officials in our cabinet and administration to sift through that and figure it out, which then led to the Municipal Modernization Act. And within a year after relentless focus on it at leadership every week, <laughs> Uh, talking point on the agenda within about a year that was signed into law and a real credit to our legislative colleagues but a real credit to the municipal leaders who were so aggravated with the mundane time-consuming cost-consuming rules of government that just would go away with the stroke of, of the pen the other thing that happened to us in February of 2015, it wouldn't stop snowing. <laughs> if everyone remembers <laughs> that. It was blizzard, it was cold, it was a relentless storm, and we had to not screw that up, right? And you as municipal officials, no, don't screw up snow, and don't screw up trash pickup, right? <laughs> and so it wouldn't stop snowing, but it was really, a, a, in real time, an opportunity for our office, and me in particular, to say, okay, I need your cell phone and your cell phone and your cell phone and I'd literally just text you and call you like how are things going in Everett, how are things going in Salem, how are things going in Brockton, what do you need? And then it would be in real time connecting you to MEMA and the, the operations teams to deploy the assets you needed to shovel out and provide the service locally. So that was something we learned early on and then it turned into our protocol for crisis management, whether it was a gas explosion in Merrimack Valley, certainly COVID, and then we figured out that this relationship had to be reinforced. So a lot of communication, relationships built on trust, and then just a flow of information back and forth that helped to really begin to solidify. The other was elevating the division of local services to the executive office. And we put the right person in charge with Sean Cronin. So that office, which was kind of in the bowels of ANF Secretary Heffernan, not your fault, but really wasn't functioning, right? I mean, you think about, you'd get an email occasionally from DLS and maybe you'd read it, maybe you wouldn't, and to becoming an essential communication place and exchange of information between Sean Cronin's shop and the municipal leaders throughout the Commonwealth. When I was talking to some of the local leaders for this piece, they, they vividly remembered those Snowmageddon days <laughs> and getting on the phone with you every morning saying, okay, here's Although what I need. In uh, February of 2023, we might not be worried about that. <laughs> <laughs>
It's true. I love that example though because it, it really it came through that people had access to you. Someone said uh, they probably exchanged thousands of text messages with you over the years that you were in that office. And so and it was clear to them how important it was to have a point person, someone that they knew was going to own this and that they knew would follow through if they called you. Um, I also know that from our conversations, it wasn't enough just to have an executive lead if we were really going to change the way that the state interacted with 351 cities and towns, you needed a statewide strategy, a whole of government approach. So I would love to hear more about that. As the executive champion, how did you bring those other parts of the system into this? Well, it wasn't just me, it was a team of people. I, I, obviously the governor uh, has an extensive cell phone list of the municipal leaders as well and is e equally available to receive and then uh, deploy uh, a request to our team. And that's where it wasn't just me and the governor being available and visible in your communities, but so had the cabinet of secretaries uh, embraced the idea of being present in communities. I know Jay Ash is here. He's known for his FRAP tour. We still don't know how you didn't gain an ounce <laughs> after that FRAP tour of the Commonwealth, but you made it a point, and not a point, but you made it integral to your operations and the secretaries across the board, integral to their operations, that yeah, we better get out there too and follow up. And what also happened is I, I was on the, developing the strategy from the executive order and I said the first thing I need to really do is get out in your communities and a few things happened that I didn't expect I started to visit through uh, Dan Gates from the office call community uh, of Brockton or uh, Northfield or air and the first thing is okay now who's going to show up at this meeting when I get to City Hall or Town Hall that was the first test because sometimes it was a couple of people and there was not a paper on the table to you go to Quincy or Everett and you had your whole team around the table with a you know, presentation. These are all the things that we're working on and we need you to get on these like tomorrow. And so I knew that there was a varying ability across municipalities, rural, suburban, and, and, and city and gateway. But then I started to collect a lot of information. So I, I'm a note taker, I take it all in. And it was a bit overwhelming because the whole import of this is to collect the information to follow through. Not just say I'm here, check off the box, I'm not going back there, but to follow through on what we had learned originally. Not only visiting, but understanding and actively listening and then taking it in and having the team approach to helping advance whatever that need is and so I couldn't just take this in and chat with the gov about this we needed the whole team to buy in and they did fully and so then we created a system of communication that was really important to that follow-through you know, speaking of being out and seeing kind of the varied resources and priorities of different communities one of the programmatic pillars of the strategy was the community compact program um, which I'm sure you know, very popular <laughs> with a lot of the local leaders in this room. And, and it really was designed to help build local capacity in some of those core areas like financial management, economic development planning, HR. And so I, I want to hear more about that. What was the, the why there? What was the motivation? Well, some, you know, some of it too, and the governor and I talked a lot about this and we heard this when we were local officials and it, you know, just would, would stay with you. Like, for instance, there might be a community that is struggling and heading toward receivership, and then government instincts would be, okay, we've got to go help, and then provide resource or kind of a bailout to a community. And then that would be unsettling to another community that's making good decisions and doing everything right, and why aren't we getting rewarded for the good behavior? And so it set up this tension so that needed to be addressed. That we don't want to wait till it's really late and you're having a problem. We want to get in there way ahead of that and get you on a better path. It's really important. And then just knowing that there was 
these varying abilities that were really, you know, startling for me to see that some communities really didn't have a strong financial management program or budgeting strategy or capital plan, like fundamental things. Although they might want to work on the new shiny thing, their fundamental things weren't in place yet, so they weren't ready for that. And so then with John Cronin's expertise and Carolyn and Jay and others, really understanding that we need to get every community to a fundamental foundational level of governance, finance, management, operation, maybe wage classifications. And yes, you can get to some planning, but you've got to have this other stuff in place. And so then that leveled the playing field for the smaller and more rural communities that didn't have as much resource as a city like Salem or Everett or Lemonster, not picking on you, or Taunton, <laughs> but just to make sure that they also would be able to compete for grant programs and be able to get what they deserve for their community. And so the best practice program started with 40 best practices. It is now 140 best practices, so it's evolved over time based upon what local officials have said to us, if we had a little bit more technical assistance and a small grant from you, we could add, for instance, diversity, equity, and inclusion policy into our governance strategy, which is where we are now. Uh, so that I think it was 623 compacts. Every community signed a compact of at least two best practices, and 50% of our communities have signed two, two compacts. So it was mutual accountability. That was one thing that Jeff Beckwith always says, it's gonna be a two-way. You're gonna provide us 25, 35, $50,000 to help us get this best practice in place, and we promise you in two years, we will get that done. And then provide the expertise to literally shape you know, the best practices and governance at the local level. And then we added on more, right? The IT program, uh, municipal fiber, regionalization and efficiency. So it's added up to over $50 million over these eight years. So smaller dollars, but added up to a lot. And I want to credit the legislature for you know, stepping up in, in this is a new program and we're funding it every year so that there was some consistency. One of the other aspects of the program that I heard a lot about was how it wasn't one size fits all. So it really recognized the diversity on the ground. Well, it's it's example, right? It's not the state saying, you have to go and work on this breast practice. Right. You know, it's, it's a choice, it's a menu, and you go back to your team and figure out the things you want to choose to work on. Okay. I'm not gonna ask you to pick your favorite, <laughs> but <laughs> can you pick an example of what this looked like in practice? Can you talk us through? <laughs> sure. So, uh, we got big and small, right? So if you take, uh, you know, for instance, you take, uh, if you want to take Brockton, right? Brockton was a, a really good community where Mayor Carpenter and Mayor Sullivan now, uh, you had some fundamental things that you had to work on and you also wanted a housing development strategy and you wanted a downtown development strategy and you've got a transit oriented development, but you really needed some fundamental work around budgeting and finance and operations and really getting City Hall, you know, working as a team to a place like Gosnold, which has a village known as Cuddy Hunk, which has 70 year round people that really needed a lot of help with figuring out how they were going to address their municipal infrastructure, which pipes were led and were near failing condition and had to work with our administration when they were looking at a federal grant, but without them providing some local resource, they weren't gonna get it to fix the pipes. Came to us and in a matter of like a week, we closed a $1.7 million funding gap for Gosnell. How about Mount Washington, which is I can't say it's one of my favorites, but I do have a picture of Bash Fish Falls in my office as a reminder that Mount Washington, which has about 120 people, mattered because they needed to have access to broadband. It didn't have it until we figured out the plan for them. And when I went to visit that community, I'll never forget, it was like open the 
pound building, and there are all the people, like all 120 people there. They're so happy. There's our, there's our connection to the world right there, and thank you. Uh, I, I'll just a shout out to Shelby. I'll never forget going to Heath, and he won't either. And Heath was a, an example of 700 people or so community. Went into that town hall, was part of the visiting tour, and I was faced with a lot of closed arms, cross legs, and very angry looking people. And I, I got a sense of why pretty quickly. And they were really frustrated that many promises to build out broadband in their community and it wasn't happening. And taking that back to the office, uh, we figured out there were resources. The state had funded the bond monies for the broadband 53 last mile communities, but there was no plan to really build that out. Carolyn, you were a big part of helping us develop that strategy and lead the way where all 53 of those communities will have full connection uh, by the end of our administration. So those are just a few examples, but there are communities that have been, Mayor Tyre, Eric, like in, in Taunton, the newer mayor, really adept at stacking up grants. Mm -hmm. uh, those small grants, Mayor Bernard stacked up to a lot for you and really helped you now build on that with economic development and housing development like you've never seen before. You're talking about unlocking resources. One of the things I heard a lot from local leaders for this piece was obviously state resources are very important to making operations run locally. Also, they talked about how just infuriating it had been in the past to try to unlock those resources at times. And I think one of the parts of the strategy that just I found so clever was how in response to that, essentially changed the way that the state did their grants. So instead of leaving it to municipalities to try to figure out, oh, which resource might be right and have to apply to tons of grants, which particularly is, you talk about all the time, disadvantaged the smaller communities that don't have those dedicated grant writing staff. You created this new expectation on the part of the state to help municipalities figure out, well, what are the resources that are available? How do I connect to them? So I'd love to hear more about this piece. I thought it was so interesting and impactful. Yeah. Daniel, that evolved <laughs> uh, over a little bit of time. Uh, we thought we were being really clever, Sean and Carolyn, when we said we're going to come up with a community compact calendar and we're going to take grants as we know them as an administration and put them on the calendar and we're going to use the DLS listserv to notify you so that you would know and your team would know when a grant is coming out so you wouldn't miss the opportunity. Because we heard a lot that it was too late, I didn't, I didn't know about this grant. So we started the community company calendar, which is still very effective. But when it comes to economic development, the governor tasked uh, uh, Secretary Keneally and his team and me to work together. And we engaged a lot of municipal officials and business leaders took a tour again of the Commonwealth to put an economic development plan together. And one of the common things we heard everywhere across this tour was it's, you have resources, it's too complicated uh, because the timing of these resources and grants are, is varied. And the process doesn't always end in success, so there's an uncertainty associated with deploying these resources, which then makes it uncertain for the private developer, the public-private partnership to really form if the private can't depend on these resources coming forward. So we flipped the whole way of doing business and real credit to Secretary Keneally and his team and Juan Vega, I don't know if he's here, for coming up with a one-stop program. And then our office said we need an expression of interest to preface that. So you municipality, go back to your team. What are the things you want to work on? Why don't you spend the first three months of this working with us and telling us what you want to work on, and then we're going to, we're going to serve as your free consultants, and we're going to assess whether you're really ready for that MassWorks grant or you're better suited to go for the site readiness grant or the underutilized property grant that will then get you ready for that MassWorks grant. And so we got really smart about advising munis municipalities, and municipalities got v very skilled at figuring out what their priorities are and then how to access our resources. And then 
the, the final point on that is I was really intent on making sure we get to yes. We have this 10, now 13 programs in one stop. There should be a way for every community who's applying to get something to move the ball forward. And that's really important for their momentum. And I, I think literally in every case, we could get out how to get to yes. You might not have gotten to exactly what you wanted when you started the process, <laughs> but you got something and you got to yes. So we've talked about some of the programs and the core components of this. Something that really struck me while writing this piece and particularly talking to local leaders was that the approach added up to more than just the sum of its parts. It's not just a handful of programs. It really was a new working relationship between the state and cities and towns. So the, the brief goes into one particular example, COVID, but we talked about how you know, this was helpful outside of crises. So I, do you have another example that you'd like to share about how just that new relationship or that strengthened relationship led to change? Of course. I'm, I'm probably going to have to just talk about my home area. <laughs> <laughs> on that one. But, uh, I want to just talk about uh, the promise of hot dogs from Fall River, uh, which we're going to have to to check in on, uh, but that was just an, an example on COVID. Uh, we all worked very well together uh, in COVID you know, response time uh, because we had a level of trust in the relationship already formed and we weren't strangers and we were able to share an awful lot of information. And I will always be grateful for the municipal leaders who gave us a lot of feedback to help us be better at serving the people during those most challenging times. I want to give uh, Ed Augustus a shout out, and I know he's here, uh, right here. He was a former city manager of the city of Worcester, now chancellor of uh, Dean College. And uh, this was a, an example of a mayor incorporating that whole team approach in city government. Now, you know where the city of Worcester is situated. It's in the middle of the Commonwealth. There is no ocean. There is no you know, tourism destination. There is no beautiful mountain range. We are in the heart of the Commonwealth. And Joe Petty, uh, mayor, is here as well. But we knew we had colleges and universities, population of hardworking people. And the big asset that came out of a lot of the work we did together was a city hall literally open for business and that the department heads professional would come to a meeting, have the state be available at that meeting, whether it was Jay Ash or others from our team, and be part of the conversation around economic development opportunities. And the reason that was important is because these are private investors that can literally go anywhere, right? Why are they gonna go to Worcester? Because time is money, there's predictability in this process, we're going to work together with the state, and we're going to deliver on what we're promising to you. And the big outcome on that one was, was uh, luring the Pawtucket Red Sox to the city of Worcester, literally leaving Rhode Island. Right? Okay. It sounds it's like okay. Squad, Danielle. <laughs> we're talking with on our end, but it's okay. <laughs> there was a whole strategy around City Hall and a community that wanted the Pawtucket Red Sox to become the Worcester Red Sox eventually and a polar park and an investment, significant investment that the state made in Kelly Square and, and the, all the infrastructure around it. And, and it allowed the city to then really put a, a, a team approach together to develop an area of the city that looks today nothing like it did uh, with industrial buildings that were unoccupied and not productive in terms of the, the city's uh, finances. Really great success story. And the other one would be the biomanufacturing par park, which was an extension of Governor Baker's order around open for business at the state level, taking surplus state properties underutilized and turning them into productive parcels for you as communities to think about a reuse for. And the city took steps to rezone a state former mental health uh, hospital and surplus property into a biomanufacturing park where we now have Rushi Biologics that just doubled its building in size, will soon house 250 uh, biomanufacturing uh, job holders right there in the city of Worcester. So two really good examples of leadership at the state level, local level, and if you can make it happen in Worcester, 
<laughs> it happen anywhere. And uh, a real credit to the, the city manager and putting that model together at the municipal level. Those are examples he shared as well. <laughs> Said you were there every step of the way. That's a, you know, the point is, that's a Worcester, but everyone has something they're, they're proud of. You have something historic or something special, old or new, that you are proud of in every municipality. And the governor and I literally had a front seat of that journey all throughout this Commonwealth. And it's been an honor of a lifetime to see it. I, we could keep talking about this all afternoon. I'm going to ask one last question so we have some time for mingling and, and the snacks that are over there. So let's bring it back to where we kind of started with this project, which was trialing, trying to bottle this. What were the components and how can we make it easy for other leaders in Massachusetts or elsewhere that want to change state and local relations to, to use this and adapt it? So the, the policy brief has some underlying principles that other leaders can apply, but tell us from where you sit. What's the biggest piece of advice that you have for another state leader that might want to do something like this? Just a point on the policy brief for those who are going to review it intently or use it as a, a playbook for something else. It has a lot of tools and diagrams and how-tos in it, and it's, it's, really, it's really well done. You did an incredible job. But the, the advice that the governor and I would give is to, first of all, you know, make it your strategy. Like it, this was executive order, governor executive order number one to prioritize communities. So that was an intentional act. It was a, a choice. And that has to come at the highest level of government. Uh, the second is develop the system. The system within state government being the system of the executive office and division of local services, elevated communities, and the cabinet of secretaries, elevated communities. So communities, the first executive order, embedded in the institution of the executive branch of, um, of, our, govern of our administration and can be in any uh, state government, whether they have municipalities or counties. And then the third piece would be to, to name, a, name a champion, name a person to literally be in charge of thinking about it every single day, which I do, and to hold the team accountable. Uh, you know, Steve, you, you talked about this. I remember sitting in cabinet with former and current cabinet members and saying, okay, you're going to award that grant, but I want to see it on the map of the Commonwealth. I want to know where these grant, these dollars are going. Is it geographically diverse? Is are these dollars going to suburban, rural, and gateway cities or larger cities? Like, where, what does it look like? So there was an equity associated with the deploying of state resources provided by the legislature across the, the map of the Commonwealth, and we could see it. But it then became commonplace for all the secretaries to literally think about this in their programming design, in their travel time, in their follow-through and decision-making. But, but having a person in, in charge of that and thinking about that every day is, as I would say, a, an important piece of advice. So grateful for you being here and for all of your work. Thank you, Governor Baker. Thank you to all of the state and local leaders who are here who made this possible. We're just so grateful. I'm supposed to plug that the brief is online. <laughs> Full appendices will there be there too. Um, for everyone in the room, there's, there's printed copies and maybe more importantly, there's, there's snacks. So thank you everyone for being here and thank you again, Lieutenant Governor. <laughs>